Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, all of you, for returning to our podcast, Courageous Leadership with Virginia Pradhan. And for those of you who are new, uh, I'm Virginia Pradhan, the host of Courageous Leadership with Virginia Pradhan. And here are a few information about our podcast. Welcome to Courageous Leadership with Virginia Pradhan training you to lead with courage. We are so grateful you are all together here because today we have a very special guest who returns uh, to our, our podcast and also who is just coming back from Israel. Uh, and his name is Troy Miller. He is the CEO of uh, NRB. It's uh, an organization that does amazing things. And Troy, thank you so very much for coming here. And I will let you introduce yourself, especially for our viewers and our audience that might be new to, to our podcast, just to know a little bit about you. Sure, Virginia. Thank you. And thank you for having me again. I really appreciate it uh, and appreciate being with you and your audience. So I am Troy Miller. I am the president and CEO of the National Religious Broadcasters Association. Uh, NRB has been around for about 80 years. We advocate on behalf of our members to uh, do ministry and do what God's called them to do in the public space. So as you know, today we have a lot of uh, people out there would like to silence uh, Christians in the church, and we work very hard to make sure people like Virginia and other podcasters, radio, television, film, uh, that they get to do what God's called them to do. And and as such, I get a number of opportunities to work with various ministries, uh, not only around the country, but around the world. And and recently, uh, we had a chance to work with a ministry and a, and a organization, KKL, um, uh, uh, JNF, uh, the Jewish National Fund, uh, to go on a solidarity and support tour to Israel. So I spent all of last week uh, in Israel, and it was just an, an incredible trip. Uh, as you know, there's a war going on in Israel right now. Uh, Israel was attacked on October 7th uh, without any provocation uh, from the Hamas terrorist group. Uh, that came out of uh, an area known as Gaza, or better known as the Gaza Strip. So this is in southern Israel. The Gaza Strip is a is a, um, a section of land. I think it's about 60 miles uh, long. It's only about maybe 30 miles wide at its widest, and uh, and it runs along the Mediterranean coast, uh, borders with Israel, and then the southern border. Uh, bumps up to Egypt along with Israel. And uh, Gaza is primarily occupied by Palestinians, and it's controlled by a group called Hamas. And Hamas is actually labeled by the U.S. government as a terrorist group. And so on October 7th, um, like any other day that you could think of, uh, that you might think of, uh, you get up in the morning. It was a beautiful day, a peaceful day. Southern Israel is mainly occupied by a lot of agricultural communities um, or very small industrial communities. And these communities are very tight knit. They uh, were put together kind of almost in a commune kind of uh, uh, shared format, almost like the ch early church in, the, in Acts. Uh, they work together so that everybody has uh, kind of equal standing and, and, and their needs are met. And so it's been a real experiment in Israel. Also, just a little background before we talk about that, these communities. These communities are primarily uh, very um, peace-oriented, um, almost like we might think of back in the 1970s with some of the uh, uh, peace neck sort of communes that popped up all across the country um, in there. These are communities that are, quite honestly, very left-leaning, very progressive, um, they've worked very hard uh, for Israeli and Palestinian relationships. Um, they employed a lot of Palestinians within the communities or on the farms uh, to do work. And so the Palestinians would have permission to come across the border and come and work in these communities. 
Um, they also did things like there were several folks in these communities that would go into Palestine, into the various hospitals there and take children who weren't able to get the care because there wasn't either the expertise in doctors or equipment or or whatever it might be. Um, so they would sponsor these children. So if you sponsor somebody, then they could bring them back across the Israel border and take them to hospitals and get the care that they needed there. They would do this for children, young adults, adults uh, across. So this is a community that felt like it had a very tight and close relationship with um, the Palestinians. And then October 7th shows up and, and we had a chance uh, our group went over, uh, arrived last Sunday, uh, a week ago Sunday. Um, on Monday morning, we were, by special permission, our group was able to go into the southern region and visit these communities that were hit on October 7th. So, And we were able to meet with people who were there on October 7th, uh, community leaders, people that were in their homes, survivors uh, of this event. So we were able to get, you know, firsthand direct uh, uh, information on what went on that day. So one, one of the gentlemen who we met with um, in his community was, you know, telling us this was like any other, you know, normal days. Family got up, kids started to play outside, uh, people were fixing breakfast. Um, and then something happened that's not terribly unusual, unfortunately, in Israel. Sirens went off for a rocket attack and and so people start to, to do their normal response, get into their shelters. Uh, but unlike what's happened in the past, this rocket attack didn't just last a, a few minutes. Um, it was an extended rocket attack. It lasted. Sirens continued to go off for at least over a 30-minute period, um, which made people a little more concerned. And then this uh, small community that we're in, um, he said, you know, uh, many of the, the young men there have served in the IDF, so they know what it sounds like to be around uh, small arms gunfire and, and other things. And they said all of a sudden in this community, um, they started to hear gunfire and sounds that they hadn't heard before. Um, and so what happened to this first community we were in, it's Bari, um, was in, they, they were that morning, and the Hamas terrorists came up through the orchards, through the agricultural section. It's kind of a buffer between the community and the Gaza Strip and um, uh, created a hole in the, in the fence of the community in the back and, and then just flooded in. And as they flooded in, um, they basically just started to attack the residents and the citizens of, of that community. And so if you can imagine that you wake up, you're, 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 you're getting ready, your kids are getting breakfast, and then all of a sudden, Virginia, you start to hear, you, you know, the rocket attack, and then you start to hear all this firearms. And this fire, these firearms aren't off in the distance. They're very, very close. And he said, you know, what, what happened then was, you know, as the first few closest houses, you, you know, got hit, some of these terrorists were dressed in Israeli police uniforms. Some of them were dressed as Israeli soldiers and they would go up and knock on doors and as people would uh, open the doors and they would shoot and murder these people. Um, and, and, and that's what went on in this community for hours uh, upon hours. And, and so they started to text message each other you know, about what was going on. Don't open your doors, get into your shelters, get away from your windows, you, you know, hide. Um, but these communities, for the most part, don't have any police stations. They're small communities. Uh, they certainly didn't have any soldiers there. And uh, Israel has some fairly strict gun laws. Uh, so there were very few weapons in the community uh, for them to defend themselves. So they're, they're only real choice was to hide in their homes and uh, hope for the best. Um, and, th and that's really all they could do. Um, but the, the Hamas many, just... Many of them, many of them, even if they were trying to hide themselves, they were discovered by, uh, by uh, the Hamas because they were opening doors or destroying doors and uh, all kinds of things. So... 
and many many people were taking us hostages uh, back to yeah. Gaza. Yeah, that that's exactly right, v- Virginia. What what then happened in these communities was, you know, they just weren't prepared to, you know, defend themselves against armed soldiers with all of their weapons and hand grenades and and uh, other, you know, various equipment things that they had, and and so people in these communities. Uh, you know, were basically slaughtered. They they were civilians, um, and as you said, Hamas just indiscriminately you, you know killed people. We, we we were at one house, one story, and then when they couldn't get people to open their houses, Virginia, they would start them on fire. Yes, and wait mm-hmm. wait for the people to to have to be forced out of the house in order uh, to shoot them, and and it's, and yeah, and then as you young. said, they kidnapped people from the community and. Yeah, if I remember correctly from a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, reports, uh, those uh, Hamas uh, people, soldiers, they have maps with everything about where the school is, where the kindergarten is, and they were targeting all this, the community center and so forth. They even um, knew where the the people, uh, the important people in, in the town will be to make sure that they will kill them. And uh, so they were well prepared. They, it was not an accident. It was a plan. Yeah, this this wasn't just a random kind kind of thing. This wasn't the the lone wolf kind of thing, as you said. Very well prepared. Uh, they had maps of the communities that they found on some of the the terrorists that were killed during the, the during the incursions, and um, and they were very detailed, as you said. And and a lot of the schools there, and it may sound like, why did they target schools? Well, a lot of the schools are bomb shelters, and community centers are the bomb shelters. So they knew as the sirens was going off, that's where people would be collecting. That's where people would be and and targeted that. And they were just and they were just completely inhumane uh, about what they did. Uh, our, our friend told us, you know, the story of his his seventy year old neighbor, two houses down, and 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 he heard he heard the, the Hamas people finally break into the man's house and drag the man out into his front yard, and and the man was begging for his life in Arabic, um, trying to, to, to beg for his life to the terrorists in, in, in Arabic. And the terrorists were, you know, yelling slanders at him and intimidating him. And they could hear all of this going on. And then they heard the sound of gunfire and they never heard the sound of their friend anymore. Um, um, and the they ter- were, and, um, as we, we were able to see on that day and later on, they were so proud of themselves and what they were doing. They were filming themselves and putting directly on social media to intimidate people and also to brag about the horror. You know, somebody said, and it's true, you know, people in Germany with Hitler tried to hide their horrors and everything that they did to Israeli people. But Hamas was even worse that they brag about and they put everywhere on social media how they kill, how they rape, how they uh, um, put uh, houses on fire, waiting for people to come outside to kill them. Yeah, it was beyond beyond horrifying. Yeah, Virginia, that's exactly right. We heard those stories firsthand of, of Hamas terrorists calling home, calling their parents, uh, bragging about what they had done, talking to other family members. Um, and and so again, uh, you you made a really good point that the that many in the communities made to us as well that the fact that they had such detailed maps and information and times that schools were opened and closed and things that were going on in the communities uh, there you know showed that not only had Hamas been planning this for a long time. But many of the people who who the Israelis employed, people who they thought they were friends with, they thought they had, you know, they were helping, they they thought they were doing the right things. These were the very people that were planning against them. And so there's a, a major sense of betrayal that's felt by the people in these communities uh, toward the Palestinian community in, in, in as a as a whole. There's a there's a, a sense that that 
we tried for peace and, and we were not, you know, they're not, they, they don't think of themselves as, as the, the side of Israel that was, you know, seeking war. They were always trying to seek peace and relationships with Palestine. And then this happened to their communities, these farming communities all across the southern uh, uh, border with uh, Gaza there. Um, but at the same time, Virginia, I can tell you that these communities are very resilient and 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 while they are hurting and and there's a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and heartache, uh, there's also still a strong sense of community, uh, a strong sense that they are going to rebuild and that God is still um, looks and shines upon them. And that that was a, a thing that really came through. And, and then for us, you know, as Christians down there meeting them, they were just surprised that a group of Christian leaders, or about seven of us Christian leaders, would drop everything they're doing during this time in America, get on an airplane, go to Israel, go into a war zone, uh, to meet with them and to pray with them and to encourage them, uh, they were amazed and and so appreciative and grateful that we were there uh, to support them, and that really shined through uh, for them because you know there's a lot of anti-Semitism going on in the world right now, and they're they're not immune to that news either. They know that there are a lot of marches uh, right now um, not supporting what Israel's doing. Um, but supporting the Palestinian movement. That is so true, but for us as Christians, we know exactly what the Lord requires us. He said that uh, when you, we support Israel, we bless Israel, we are blessed too. That is a, a clear path that, that you know, God asks us what to do and what is required of each one of us. But many of the, the Israeli people are not only suffering from the South part from uh, October 7, but also many of them, they had to move in hotels or other places in the North part because they are attacked from the North too. Yeah, that's correct. But both the southern cities are pretty much right now all evacuated. And so those evacuees are scattered throughout Israel in, in hotels. Um, and the same thing, there is a, a lot of concern uh, that the northern border, um, especially from Hezbollah, that there was going to be a response on the northern border. So several uh, communities there were evacuated as, as well. And, and we were able to go to Jerusalem on Wednesday and meet with a lot of these evacuees um, and also hear their stories as, as well. So there's, there's well over probably 100,000 plus people that are evacuated and in living in hotels all across Israel um, where they're, you know, relatively safe, but there, a lot of them are still not out of the range of the rockets and other things that are going on there. And, you know, there's so many life stories, so many human stories to, to talk about here. But one of the stories I, I want to talk about is just, you, you know, we don't think about is the tragedy that the kids went through those days, you know, yeah. in some of these communities, because this attack was so, uh, uh, um, um, caught off guard and, and so not predicted that, um, that, that so vicious, so vicious. Yeah. Well, it took the military a while to respond to, to, to this. So some of these families were in their houses two and three days locked in and, 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 and with the children. And so there's, there's going to be a, there's a lot of trauma. There's going to be a lot of need uh, going forward for these families in the these communities to before they really get back to any semblance of normal life, um, and that's you, you know at some point whenever the 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 military operations are over in Gaza, um, that can't even begin until that point. So. Um, I am glad. I'm glad you are mentioning this because uh, you don't hear very much in uh, uh, social media or any any news media about the sufferings 
of uh, the Israeli people, what they are suffering even right now. You hear a lot about what's going on in uh, in Gaza and uh, all those things. I am very happy that maybe it was on social media for a long time, but today I discovered from the the. Um, uh, Israeli military, they had a YouTube and they presented the interview or interrogation, if you want to say, of the director of the Gaza hospital, that he explains clear that he is not only a doctor, but he has a rank in the Hamas military, mm. that many of the doctors and nurses are employed and they are part of the military of Hamas, that those people have rooms in underneath the Gaza uh, hospital <coughs> for their own protection, which I hope will go and will spread everywhere to see not only what the ADF is saying there are so so many tunnels, so many arms and everything, but what they said from the beginning that those doctors and military those doctors and nurses are part of Hamas military. Well yeah, that that's true, Virginia. And I, I want to pick up on something you said. You know, the mainstream media, uh it, as you said, has been highlighting uh almost since day one. You, you know the the plight of the Palestinians. You know, and and we forget that you know this was started by Hamas. This this wasn't started by Israel. Israel was not firing rockets into Gaza. Israel was not uh, firing you know artillery or anything into Gaza. Hamas attacked Israel entirely unprovoked at, at a time that Israel was working on peace in, in the region with the Abraham Accords and other things that were going on. There was a, a movement of peace, and, and many think that Hamas did this uh, with its proxy, you know, being a proxy backing by Iran and others to, you know, end that peace process. And the mainstream media today uh, still doesn't talk about it. They talk about, again, what's going on in, in Gaza, but does, they don't talk about that there are hundreds of thousands of Israelis dipl- displaced from their homes as well. There are children there who have been traumatized. Um, and, 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 and the things that are going on there, I, I realize that Gaza is a, is a war zone and people are having their homes destroyed and all these things. But again, Hamas at any point could surrender and stop all of this. But they don't even care about their own people. They use their own people as human shields. We we had a chance to meet with an Israeli IDF unit, and the and the the IDF unit told us when they go into Gaza um, and they go into a home, almost always the first place they look to find weapons is to go into the child's room. And the weapons will be hidden in the children's room. Uh, They'll be hidden in in secret panels underneath cribs and beds and in closets uh, in the children's rooms, you know, of all places uh, in in the house that these would happen. Or they'll find them in schools and community centers and hospitals. That's that's where Hamas hides their, their things because they're hoping and knowing that Israel will have some restraint and not hit these kinds of targets. And so... The evil that was perpetrated that day wasn't just an evil against Israel. I know that it was against Israel and the Israeli people, but it was really an evil against humanity. There was simply no care whatsoever for humanity. Um, There are still over 126, I think, hostages missing today. We had a chance to meet with the families and, and, and supporters of hostages. There are 126 hostages still missing. And those are from people that are, are, are babies nine months old to people in their 70s or 80s uh, that, that Hamas indiscriminately took to be human shields and to be negotiating tools. Um, all of these are war crimes. All of these are against uh, the Geneva Convention uh, and, and various laws that we have around how you conduct a, a war, and yet nobody in the mainstream talks about this. And yet, if Israel, you, you know, 
bombs and there's some collateral damage to a school or a hospital. Oh my gosh, Israel's targeting this. Israel's doing that. And so, so Israel is being, you know, so unfairly treated in the mainstream media. And I think as Christians, we need to understand that message and not uh, listen to what's going on. There's an agenda within the media. There's an anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish agenda um, out there. And we need to, we're Christians, we're called to share and tell the truth. So that's why I'm on your podcast and others to talk about this. And they need our prayers and they need our support. Yes. And they're going to need that for a long time. Um, and, and we do it because prayers. we're called to love our neighbors. Exactly. Um, and but they and need our, they yeah, need our roots go deep with Israel. They need also our voice, like your voice and people that are listening now they are informed and they have the opportunity to express what they heard from you we need to uh, make sure that the entire uh, world knows that those people that were taken by uh, Hamas they we don't know many of them where they where they are their location and no medical provision was, uh, you know, set aside or provided for, for those people. It's inhumane. And it's inhumane that the, the media doesn't talk about this. And we, we need to raise those, uh, those questions and uh, those points, um, whatever we have the opportunity. But yeah, a- a- absolutely. What was uh, what? What do you think that from your trip as you return to to America? What do you think that needs to be done? Uh, you know, to wake up these people that are demonstrated in so many places in America. Well, you know, this is just a continuation of uh, the larger problem we've had on our college campuses and, and you know, with younger adults in, in America here, there's been so much indoctrination uh, and really brainwashing on, on these whole ideas, these socialist kind of communist ideas that have their roots in critical race theory and in intersectionality and, you know, critical queer theory, all of these things have created this this kind of mindset that there are two kinds of people in the world. There's oppressors and victims, you know, and everybody you fall into either that category, either an oppressor or, or, a, or a victim. And um, and now this has been applied to Israel, you know, and, and yet here's Israel was the victim of these terrible attacks on October 7th, but people seem to have ignored that and said that Israel's the uh, uh, oppressor, which is the farthest thing from the truth. Israel has sought and worked for peace harder than the Palestinian uh, organizations ever have. And that's the kind of thing I think, as you said, uh, needs to happen. We need to continue to tell the truth about the the situation uh, that Israel is not occupiers. We know as Christians, this is land that was given to Abraham 3,000 years ago. This is land God promised to the Jewish people. The Jewish people had uh, possession of this land. They had set up uh, King Saul, King David, a whole successions of, of kings in this land. Israel has been displaced and moved back to their land multiple times over uh, the last couple of uh, thousand years, as well as if you just look over I- Israel in the last 2,000 years from the time of, of Christ, um, you know, Israel has always had, the Jewish people have always had a presence in, in the land, and they were reoccupying the land long before 1948 when Israel was reestablished again as a, as a state. And I don't, I don't think the mainstream media doesn't talk about that. Uh, people just want to look at Israel as the uh, oppressor, and I really think it, a lot of it just has to do with these deep-seated ideas that have been pushed into people, and you know better than all of us, the ideas and the indoctrination that socialism and communism, you know, that works in order to separate people and to separate groups. And so that's something as the church, we have to work hard against. We have to work um, in getting the truth out and the full truth of, uh, of the message uh, as well. That is so true. And also we have to listen and explain to them 
uh, if we have any chance at all, they they have to be aware that today is Israel that they want to destroy. Tomorrow is going to be Christians. And the day after tomorrow, it's going to be even the atheist because if they don't obey what the government or a group is saying for them to repeat, they will be the one destroyed. So uh, this is a dangerous, and we need to, to stand up and we need to speak the truth. And I'm so, so grateful for your participation and for the fact that uh, you have you had such a great opportunity, you know, to go to Israel and to come over here and to share, you know, your thoughts about what is there and how we can we can help. Israeli people and uh, many times I am thinking we can help Israeli people not only in Israel but our friends here our friends here who who might go to school to MIT or Harvard or other schools and they might be afraid to go to class or uh, or their parents might be here in Dallas or somewhere else and they might be afraid about the life of their own kids and so forth. Pick up the phone, go and visit them, pray with them, do whatever it takes. Show them that you are you are their friends, and also for the ones that are so um, brainwashed with anti-Semitism, ask them questions to put holes in their uh, their ideology. That, right. You know, this way, you might you might help them, you know, to see the reality. Yeah, yeah, Virginia, you said that very well. Uh, It really is uh, upon us. This is a time for us uh, as Christians. You know, we're going into the Christmas season here. We're going to celebrate the birth of Christ, the birth uh, of our Lord. We we know what special place the Holy Land um, plays and holds in our hearts. But this is a time for us for as Christians to not just talk about uh, Christmas and talk about what it means. It's really a time for us to show uh, what it means to be a Christian. So if you have a Jewish neighbor, if you have a Jewish family, if you know people in America, I guarantee you that they feel it some way, somehow they feel alone and isolated. Reach out and tell them uh, that you love them and that you're praying for them and that you care for them and for who they are. Um, as a people, as all of us created in God's image. And so this is a time I'd I'd really call for us as Christians to step up and step out in, in, in the, in the community and into the culture and not just sit back and, and be silent, uh, and comfortable with what we've done every other Christmas. And also to remember all of the families and our friends in Ukraine, there's still a war going on in, in Europe and to remember uh, those people as well and to be praying for peace there. Um, the world is a, is a tough place and really Christianity is the only voice of hope. And we need to share that hope and to show that hope uh, to as many people as we can. And right now our Jewish friends need that more than ever. Oh, you said it so, so well, uh, Troy, and I hope that our viewers and our audience will take that to heart and will do what, what needs to be, to be done. Thank you so very much for coming to our podcast and sharing your thoughts and your experience as you return from Israel. And thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You will be welcome. want to know more about Virginia Prodan, her coaching program, buy her book, Saving My Assassin, or invite Virginia to speak at your events, visit virginiaprodanbooks.com.